All right, so now that we have our three equations, let's practice doing some conversions. And we're gonna do this by using our first question on our homework assignment, which gives us the equation y equals negative x squared minus 2x plus 1. And we need to convert it into vertex form. And then it asks us for the vertex point and the y-intercept. So let me start by roughly drawing this parabola. A is negative, so it is facing down. Our first step to get it into vertex form is getting an A and K value out. So we can do this by extracting the negative. We'll have x squared plus 2x inside the parentheses, and we'll have plus 1 as our k value placeholder. The next step is to complete the square, and I do this by getting the square outside of the parentheses. So y equals negative x plus 1 squared plus 2. So you might be wondering why plus 2, and that's because I skipped a step. So if we take this x plus 1 squared and expand it out, we get x squared plus 2x plus 1. And you'll notice that we don't have a plus 1 in this parentheses, and so we add our k value placeholder to that, and that's why we get this plus 2. So, can anyone tell me the vertex? Well, the vertex is hk, so looking at our equation, it would be negative 1, 2. All right, quickly before we have to leave, the question asks for the intercept, and we get that from the original equation, so c equals 1. Do you have any questions about this? Make sure that you take a homework if you have not already done so, and have a great week. We've all been here before. You're sitting in class listening to a lesson that gets more and more confusing. Then, just before the bell rings, the teacher asks the class if there are any questions. Now, in this case, our student here clearly does have a lot of questions that she wants to ask. But as she looks around the room, it seems to her that nobody else has questions. The lessons seem to be clear to everyone else. Now, we know that this is not true. The reality of this situation is that everybody has a question and everybody is just as confused. But in the end, our student decides not to say anything. Why is that? Because she assumed that everybody else understood the material and that if she asked a question about it, she would stand out. She doesn't want to be embarrassed. She doesn't want to waste everyone else's time. She certainly doesn't want to seem unintelligent. So in the end, she keeps her confusion to herself. And why doesn't anybody else speak up? Because they're also looking around for cues about what's going on in the situation. They're also trying to figure out what the group norm is, but they don't see anybody else speaking up, so they decide to keep quiet as well. To sum up, you make an assumption. You assume that other people are seeing things differently than you do, but that assumption is wrong, and that incorrect assumption guides your behavior. This is a classic case of what social psychologists call pluralistic ignorance, which has been defined as follows. Pluralistic ignorance is a group level phenomenon. 
wherein individuals belonging to a group mistakenly believe that others' cognitions, their attitudes, their beliefs, their feelings, and or their behaviors differ systematically from their own. That might be a lot to take in all at once, so let's break down that definition a little more and refer back to our classroom example. First, the definition tells us that pluralistic ignorance is what is known as a group level phenomenon. That means it happens when we are in a group setting. You belong to all sorts of groups, of course. As in our first example, you could be a member of a group of students in a classroom. Here, we see a math class, which is also a group. Other groups you could belong to include people at a party, a crowd at an athletic event, or even people waiting in line at Duncan. Now these groups are all temporary, so let's look at another example before breaking our definition down even further. Researchers frequently study attitudes toward alcohol consumption on college campuses as a typical case of pluralistic ignorance. Imagine that this is you. You're a college student, and you participate in a variety of activities that undergraduate students take part in. On this particular night, you decide to go to a party with some friends. Studies have found that students incorrectly view other students' alcohol consumption behavior in college. In reality, most students drink far less than other students assume. They're less enthusiastic about excessive drinking or binge drinking than one might assume. But students' misperceptions could lead them to drink more alcohol so that they can fit in and conform with the perceived norm. However, you don't know what's going on inside of the minds of other group members. So you decide to act in line with what you assume is the norm and you drink more than you usually would. This misperception is what pluralistic ignorance is all about. So far, we've established that pluralistic ignorance can occur in temporary groups. However, you also belong to groups that are more longstanding and that are more central to your personal identity. These group memberships could be related to your religious or political affiliations, or to your membership in certain groups in your community, like sports teams or other organizations. Pluralistic ignorance occurs when we are in any of these groups. Actually, it can make itself felt even when we are just thinking about our group's norms and ideals. Next, the definition specifies that pluralistic ignorance is related to cognitions or behaviors. You've already learned that pluralistic ignorance is something that happens at the group level. So these cognitions and behaviors also occur at the group level. But what are cognitions and behaviors? Let's use our example. Our cognitions, as we mentioned, are our thoughts, feelings, or attitude towards something. In our classroom example, the main character's thoughts involve confusion, and that confusion is shared by other members of the group. In the college party example, the attitude was negativity towards binge drinking, and that attitude was also consistent with the attitudes of other people in the group. Our behaviors are simply our actions and what we prefer to do. Let's focus on the preferred actions in each of our two examples. In the classroom example, all of the students were confused with the lesson and they wanted to ask questions. In the college party example, all of the party goers wanted to have only one drink. So these are the shared intended actions of the group but you don't know what's going on in the minds of those around you. So you don't know about this shared attitude or intended behavior. Why don't these intended behaviors occur? It's because of the third component of pluralistic ignorance, misperception. Misperception is the key part of pluralistic ignorance. The individual mistakenly believes that others' thoughts, feelings, or behaviors do not match their own. There is a mismatch between the actual group norm and your perception of the group norm. Let's look at the college party example again. Here, everyone misperceived the attitudes of the other students at the party. 
which may have stemmed from social or mainstream media's portrayal of drinking at college parties. Due to this preconceived notion, everyone thought that the other people at the party enjoyed binge drinking. However, everyone was actually against binge drinking. This misperception affected your actions, causing you to drink a lot more at the party. In this case, pluralistic ignorance had consequences that are negative for your health. Now to the classroom example. Our main character here misperceived the attitudes of their classmates. She and her peers thought that no one else in the room was confused about the lesson. But actually, everyone was confused. This misperception affected the character's next actions along with everyone else's in the room. Because she thought no one else was confused, she did not ask a question. So in this instance, pluralistic ignorance hindered everyone's learning. Overall, the main point is that we might assume the existence of certain group norms that do not actually reflect the group members' individual feelings. That could lead us to keep our opinions to ourselves. In the end, we conform to norms that do not actually exist. The reality is, if we spoke up, we might be surprised at how many allies we would have. Historically, pluralistic ignorance has had an impact on a much larger scale. Mass atrocities have started with hate speech and dehumanization of other groups. This persecution goes unchallenged by public opinion, maybe because people think that the group norm is to despise and derogate an outgroup. They don't hear anyone else speaking out against these destructive words or actions. They don't have any direct evidence that anyone else is bothered by what's going on. The Nazi regime is a perfect example of this. They forced Jews to wear stars of David and demonized Jews in speeches and propaganda. But do we hear stories about many non-Jewish citizens speaking out against these actions and words? Not really. But do we really believe that all non-Jewish Germans felt the same toward Jews? Probably not. In many instances of mass atrocities, people wrongly assumed that other people saw things differently than they did. And that leads the individual to conclude that staying silent is the best course of action. However, if more people would speak out against hate speech and dehumanization, Maybe we could prevent the horrific outcomes of mass atrocities. As we've seen, pluralistic ignorance can occur in a variety of circumstances, and you might unknowingly have experienced it before. It happens because we don't know what's going on in other people's minds. So we make an assumption. We assume that they see things differently than we do. But that assumption is often wrong. And that incorrect assumption affects your behavior, whether that means not asking questions, conforming to a group norm, or not speaking up about something. Given this information, we hope that you can recognize pluralistic ignorance in your everyday life.